the rapid deployment of your RPM program as we transition to a post-pandemic world. My name is Doreen Cordova. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development for Clear Arch Health. Before we get started, I want to inform you that today's presentation is being recorded, as well as any questions you may submit. Uh, with those questions in mind, please submit them using the chat feature, and we will be addressing question and questions and answers at the end of the webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, first, I want to introduce you to our panelists, and I'd like to uh, introduce you to Dr. Joseph Kvedar first. He's at Mass General Brigham. Dr. Kvedar has focused on driving innovation and creating market and gaining acceptance for telehealth for nearly three decades. He is now applying his expertise, insights, and influence to the advance of adoption of telehealth and virtual care strategies at the national level. Dr. Kvedar is the professor of dermatology at Harvard Medical School and has served as the president of the American Telemedicine Association and is currently the chair of the board. In his spare time, he's also an author and has written two books. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kvedar, for joining us today. And you will be discussing the evolution of telehealth and the changes as a result of the pandemic. Welcome to our uh, webinar. Delighted to be with all of you. Thank you. And next up is Chris Otto. He's the Senior Vice President uh, at ClearArch Health for Technology and Operations. His topic will be delivering innovation in a crisis, partnering to move client programs forward. Chris will review steps to operationalizing your RPM launch. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us. And last up is uh, John Bojanowski. He's the new president for Clara Child. Thank you, John, for joining us today. He will be talking about the future tele of telehealth in a post-pandemic world. We really appreciate you joining us today, John. Thank you, Jerrine, and I'd actually like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we know your schedules are busy, and we appreciate you spending the next 45 minutes to an hour with us. We'll try to make sure it's a worthwhile investment of your time. Uh, we'll start a little bit with a, a little bit of a look back over the last year on what has occurred and how telehealth and remote patient monitoring have evolved. But we'll really focus most of our time today spent looking forward and how a rapid deployment of your RPM program still makes sense. So as we transition to this post-pandemic world, which we are also looking forward to. Thank you very much. So now let's turn back to Dr. Kvedar. Dr. Kvedar, how one comes to embrace telehealth uh, in a life's work is different for everyone. Can you share your personal story with us? How did an accomplished dermatologist become a telehealth evangelist? Thanks for asking, Doreen. And it, it is a personal story. I was uh, in the early 1990s, sort of looking for a career change. My, my first part of my career was as a, a bench researcher, believe it or not, and always been a clinician as well, but was looking for something new to do. And I fell upon an experiment that my department chair uh, wanted me to, to, uh, <clears throat> to carry out with a new technology called uh, um, digital imaging which we now, of course, it's ubiquitous, it's in our phones, it's everywhere. And the idea was, would that be applicable to dermatology? So that was how it started. But it was really during that experiment that I had an epiphany one day about if we're able to separate the knowledge base part of healthcare delivery from the actual patient, how much we could extend access. And more importantly for our discussion today, efficiency. And efficiency is something that's always stuck in my mind. In fact, once I got going after that, the first group we formed, we prototyped an early remote monitoring uh, solution for heart failure and tried it out with a, a, a Windows tablet back in the old days and so forth. But it was always the idea that if we were able to do that, that patients would keep themselves healthy in the home and uh, not hit the high cost part of the system. And of course, that's really what the value proposition still is for remote patient monitoring today. Along the way, it's been a fun journey. I've been able to be involved with the American Telemedicine Association at a leadership level a couple of times. As uh, you mentioned, I've written a couple of books. Um, and um, I'm, I'm now also involved, again, back to our theme for the day. One of the other roles that I play is I'm the co-chair of the AMA's committee 
on digital medicine reimbursement, which has put forward a lot of the remote monitoring uh, reimbursement codes that are driving the market uh, today. So that's a quick snapshot of uh, where I've been and, and how excited I am to be part of this industry and to be with all of you today. Well, thank you. Yeah, and definitely the work in, in terms of uh, successfully launching CPT codes for reimbursement for remote patient monitoring has changed everything for RPM. Uh, so I'd like to step back a little bit and because I, I am firmly aware that we're talking about the rapid deployment of programs post pandemic. However, we need to revisit a little bit of, of that early stage and even go back a little bit further because telehealth has been around a long time. So could you share with us a little bit of the evolution of telehealth up until that early 2020 point? I can, although I will say that it was to, to, to sort of compare that point in history, it, uh, and it was a long time. <clears throat> But it does seem a little bit quaint now because so much has happened in the last 16 months. And now really telehealth is a household word. Uh, patients know what we're talking about. Clinicians have engaged. So I'd like to do that trip down memory lane fairly briefly uh, because most of it, the top line is most of it was uh, fits and starts. A lot of it was proof of concept work. Um, a lot of it was in very narrow sectors of our industry like the home care sector. Uh, and others where uh, people had uh, a, a financial incentive, again, I'm going back to the home care industry, in particular, a financial incentive to be more efficient. And that's why, uh, for instance, RPM was, was our early deployment in a number of home care agencies. But even that, uh, and as successful as that was for them, in the overall grand scheme of healthcare delivery was a small portion. In fact, uh, in 2019, of all of the healthcare claims filed for uh, patient care services, telehealth represented 0.8% of all those claims. Um, whereas a year ago in the height of the lockdowns, it was 30%. So that's kind of the jump we saw just in that short period of time. And it really changed how we all talk about this, this whole marketplace and, and the awareness as, as well. Absolutely, definitely. That the, the pandemic seemed to be, you know, the catalyst for rapid adoption, and so you know, we we look back at that time and, and consider the different organizations we worked with and their level of experience with connected care programs. Some of them were very new uh, to either remote patient monitoring or to connected care in general, telehealth, telemedicine. Others had been researching and considering adopting a, a, this into their standard model of care, but taking a you know, slower approach to that. And then some that were experienced with it, although maybe in hindsight, they look at it now and consider that they were underutilizing those services to your point earlier. Uh, in early March, we received an email from one of our clients who had been researching and considering and planning a program for a while. And they sent us an email and that email just really spoke volumes about what everybody was kind of feeling at that time. And it said, sometimes it takes the fever of a pandemic to make the people actually acutely aware of the need to put in place progressive equipment and care strategies. And that's really how so many of us felt at that time that, you know, you could sit on the fence and you could plan and plan and plan, but this was the time to commit and take action. Uh, it was a really interesting time. So, you know, you think about those organizations struggling with it, we really understand that patients were also struggling with things at that time, because they had care in place, they had routines and patients with chronic conditions had regularly scheduled appointments that suddenly were either canceled or delayed. And so this information from the CDC really speaks to that. Uh, it mentions that four in 10 US adults reported avoiding medical care uh, because of concerns related to COVID-19. Of those populations, many of them had disabilities, many of them had two or more chronic conditions, and of those with the two or more chronic conditions, many of them were aged over 65. So keenly, they, they were very much at risk. And we heard it directly from our customer base where many of them had experienced an uptick in amputations amongst their patient populations with diabetes. So this is a very critical time. Uh, 
we, we think about these organizations, we think about the patients they serve and how to better help them. So Dr. Kvedar, how did patient and provider attitudes towards telehealth shift last year in your experience? Yeah, it's hard to be succinct on that one. It's such a, a major and, and interesting topic. I do have some data to share. And, and I would, before I do that, I'll just point out that in my own personal experience today, or not today, yesterday, I was in the office. I'm still seeing people who waited that 16 months out before they came in. So that's a real phenomenon. And I would also just footnote that to say, those are the individuals for the most part that couldn't get their problem solved by telehealth. And I wanna underscore that because the other part of our message is the growth in telehealth. And that was for those, I guess, fortunate souls where the problem they had could be solved uh, remotely. And so for those folks, it was a huge win. Uh, I'll quote some stats from the COVID-19 Healthcare Coalition that uh, is an organization anchored by Mayo Clinic and the MITRE Corporation, ATA was a member as well. And they did some very high quality research and this, they did a consumer side and a provider side. The consumer side uh, showed 83% of patients reporting that they had a very high quality outcome with their telehealth experience. 78% felt that their healthcare concerns were being addressed. Uh, it's all high numbers like that, high, high numbers like that on the patient satisfaction side. On the physician side, I had another um, opportunity to review some data from an international market research firm called Ipsos, and uh, they just shared this the other day. And so this well, fun part about these stats is it goes beyond the US. So this is comparing physician usage in 2020 versus 21 in four countries. And I'll just rattle them off because I think it's pretty fascinating. So in Brazil for 2020 is 31%, 55% in 2021. USA, 26% in 2020, 70% in 2021. India is 27% in 2020, 47% in 2021. And then the UK, 14% in 2020. 63% in 2021. So those numbers alone tell you doctors are embracing this. I'll just finish by saying that it is a hybrid environment now, that there, there's as much people coming in the office as getting, there are certainly people getting telehealth. We're figuring out the right mix of that. The beauty of a solution like RPM is it only enables us to do more virtually with our patients. And, and that's a wonderful thing uh, uh, in that regard. Yeah, so Dr. Kvedar, it's, you know, it's interesting for those of us who have been in or around healthcare for, for a number of years. I, I can't, there's not a moment in time that I can think about. We always complain about healthcare moves too slowly and it drags along. And we went from zero to 100 miles an hour overnight. And it affected everybody. I mean, this is the other thing. It affected, obviously, the, the individuals, the patients. It affected the payers. It affected the providers and those of us that, you know, the digital health companies working with them as well. So, Chris, maybe you can comment now in terms of, you know, with the impact that it's had on us and our clients. And as we start to really look at how do we, how do we deliver rapid employment, deployment of, of RPM programs and really help our, our clients move forward? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, uh, March, 2020 was uh, a, a very interesting time. As you mentioned, it, it's, it's, it's been a breakneck pace. And uh, I think there were clearly two themes of client response to the pandemic. And in, in one camp, uh, organizations were, uh, able to adapt to that change quickly, embrace uh, the new care models, and and quickly implement uh, the, the the new virtual healthcare. And then then those clients that uh, were were more or less paralyzed by by you know what they were faced with, and and uh, it, it took some time to adapt. Um, while most of them were 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 forced, I, mean, I think to Dr. Kavadar's statistics, uh, um, you know there were most providers did embrace telehealth in some capacity, but uh, but beyond that, it was it, it took a little bit longer for some of those organizations. And I think from my perspective, it, it seems that the, the difference in those those two themes was uh, those organizations that had some form of virtual strategy in place prior to the pandemic. Um, and by that, I mean that, that none of these technologies are new. Telehealth is not new. Remote patient monitoring is not new. And so, um, you know, we certainly have, have had organizations that have De deployed some of those technologies or considering it or had a roadmap in place. And, and because that they were able to react very quickly because they were pre-socialized to some of the, the, the strategies. And 
Um, that was that was the case for one client in particular, um, an organization that's a national home health care organization. As you can see here, we have a we have a new white paper that is actually um, the the subject matter focuses on on this uh, and this organization that we've worked with for uh, going on three years now, or a little over three three years. Uh, they have over 700 locations nationwide. Uh, to date, over 2,000 patients enrolled in the remote patient monitoring program. Uh, the, the populations include primarily cardiac patients, congestive heart failure and coronary artery disease, as well as pulmonary patients, uh, COPD patients that are also uh, enrolled in that program. And then, um, so as we, we talk about this particular client and through the, the pandemic would ultimately uh, go on to serve 600 patients with, with COVID-19 specifically. And uh, what's unique about this relationship is because it is that they were very actively involved in developing a long-term uh, strategic virtual healthcare strategy over time. And uh, we were fortunate as a vendor to be invited uh, to their table, to their, to their strategic planning sessions and participate in roundtable discussions to help build out that roadmap. Uh, so in this particular, clay, in, in this particular case, uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, just just a few months earlier, we had we had laid out a roadmap, and uh, because of the relationship, we had uh, worked closely with them to identify uh, features that they wish to implement over the next uh, next uh, twelve to eighteen months. Already, um, it it happened much faster than anybody had uh, anticipated. And I recall a I'm sure Dreen does as well a, a, a conversation in early March where uh, they they you know basically. Uh, called us up and and they wanted to compress this timeline. Ultimately, we, as, as we'll explain, would compress that timeline uh, from the point of conversation in March. Uh, we launched uh, this revised program uh, on April 1st. And uh, specifically, uh, there are four components in, to this, and I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next couple slides, but um, we, we revised their existing remote patient monitoring program to deploy telehealth. Uh, we also deployed uh, the medical alert or personal emergency response system. Um, and also we, we added enhancements to the patient education module, which we'll talk about as well as uh, deploying COVID-19 screening. So uh, we'll go through all that. We were able to do this so quickly uh, because uh, many, many of these features were already pre-existing. That white paper, by the way, is a, uh, is, is will be published to our website uh, next week and, and everybody will, everybody, all the attendees on this webinar will receive a copy of that by email. Uh, so the first feature was telehealth, and uh, as as uh, as may be obvious, because this is a home health organization, this is an elderly demographic. Uh, so they are uh, the the population was a high risk population, um, and you know certainly concerns about in person visits. Um, they also had many chronic conditions, and as as Dr. Kavadar mentioned, um, there's there's you know certainly uh, some gaps in what telehealth can provide alone without. Uh, some patient populations are unable to meet their needs exclusively from telehealth. Uh, so, and that was the case uh, for this particular client. Be because the tablet included uh, telehealth capability, uh, we were able to mobilize this very quickly and we were able to provide the virtual visit in conjunction with the patient generated health data that was already coming from the connected health devices that were, were deployed with remote patient monitoring kits. Uh, so this, this is, uh, uh, you know, I think we were very fortunate in this case that we were able to combine the remote patient monitoring with the telehealth. The next feature was the personal emergency response or medical alert capability. Uh, again, because this population is an elderly, uh, is, is, a, is a more uh, uh, advanced population, uh, oftentimes living alone, uh, it, was, it was very important to the organization that they were able to deploy access to emergency services quickly, especially in light of the growing pandemic where it was, there was a lot of uncertainty at that time as to uh, how many in-person visits they'd be able to conduct in the patient's home. Uh, we knew that the disease could advance very quickly, especially among this population. So they wanted to have access to emergency care uh, and, get, and make sure that they get help very quickly. Uh, the, the client decided in this case to deploy emergency response to 100% of the population. So this was not a selective, group of the population, but 100% of the population uh, received the emergency response capability, uh, the, PERS, the PERS devices. And um, we were able to, we were able to modify the protocol so that we could notify 
the home health agency very quickly in the event of an emergency. And that was important. Um, they were certainly uh, concerned going into this implementation that it could have an adverse effect on emergency service utilization. Uh, but I'm you know, very, very pleased that we were able to monitor this very closely. We were able to uh, keep track of this and, and that was not the case during, um, and has not been the case at all through the deployment. So still today, we're still deploying uh, the PERS uh, for 100% of the patients and it does not have a, a negative impact on the emergency uh, department utilization. And in fact, it has the advantage that the patient has the confidence and the peace of mind that they know that if they do need access to those emergency services, that they have a button that they can press very quickly and get the help that they need very quickly. Uh, the next feature that we expanded for this particular client is, is the patient education. Uh, we had already deployed and, and almost all of our uh, remote patient monitoring programs today include a patient education library that's present on the tablet, as you see here. And that feature allows patients to access disease specific content and education that's very relevant to their condition. Um, all of all the education is uh, uh, tagged what we call a content channel. So uh, as patients are enrolled in the program uh, for heart failure, for example, they would receive patient education and, and videos that are specific to congestive heart failure uh, and so forth for the other conditions. In this particular case, it was simply a matter of adding additional content uh, to the library specific for COVID-19. And ultimately for this particular client, we deployed this education to every patient on program regardless of their diagnosis. Um, so we were able to do this very, very quickly and, uh, and make sure that uh, patients had the resources they needed uh, in the event of uh, pandemic, in, in the event of the pandemic. And the last feature that was expanded uh, for this particular client was our uh, patient screening or, or, or health survey questions. Uh, we, we use this feature uh, most often for uh, uncovering uh, symptoms that are not presenting themselves clinically through the, through the, um, through the biometric data, but um, asking symptomatic questions about trouble breathing or um, you know, changes in sleep patterns, and, and we can drive action from that. In this particular case, we were able to leverage this feature to very quickly deploy a patient, uh, a, uh, a COVID screening process. So asking patients a series of daily questions, uh, asking them if they have an elevated temperature, if they uh, have difficulty breathing today, today as compared to a regular day, uh, empowered the home health agency to identify patients that were good candidates for, for COVID uh, testing and to try to get those patients tested uh, and identified as quickly as possible. I will point out that this feature, even though we were using it specifically for patient for COVID screening in this case, it's a general feature that we use for most programs. And each of the questions can have yes, no responses or multiple choice responses or even numeric uh, numeric responses to the question. And each of those questions can be coupled to alert logic in our platform so that it can prioritize intervention from, cl from clinicians uh, monitoring the patients in the program. Um, and in this, in this particular case, we were able to monitor the uh, engagement rates of patients on the program and, and demonstrated over 70% monthly response rates to these surveys. So the, the, the final thing that I'd like to just summarize is, is as I said earlier, uh, each of these features we, we were able to deploy very quickly. And that's the theme of today's webinar is, is very rapid from early March to April 1st when we launched this. And we were able to do that so quickly because all of those features were pre-existing. And, and part, of our, uh, part of our onboarding process with a client is to make selections as to which of those features are enabled or configured. And uh, uh, in this case, there was, there was absolutely no software changes. So for, for those of you that have worked with uh, technology vendors in the past and are familiar with the, the, the life cycles with, with uh, product development and, and software cycles, that was not the case here. We were just uh, quickly turning on features. So uh, we were able to do that very quickly. And I think the client was very um, you know, very, very satisfied with that process. Okay, thank you for that summary, Chris. Uh, I think it's a great example of working with <clears throat> one of our client partners and what we bring to the table, especially when we're in, um, involved in ongoing communications. Some of the feedback that we got back from that client spoke to exactly that, that they were so pleased with the efforts of our team 
and that we were able to deliver a good solid program in record time. And for many of the people in the audience, Chris, they're, they're wondering the same thing. You know, if they're interested in a remote patient monitoring program, what can they expect in terms of how we can work with them uh, to deploy a program uh, quickly and get them up and running and getting that patient level data and becoming more informed? Yeah, so absolutely. So we have a uh, proven process that we've we've had the opportunity to test um, through through even the throes of the pandemic and uh, constantly optimizing this process. But uh, after one of our product specialists uh, works with a, uh, an organization uh, prior to contracting, uh, once that decision is made, they want to move forward with a program and uh, enter into a contract. Then we bring in an onboarding team and uh, we, we work very closely with that client. And we, we have a series of questions and a discovery process that's designed to uncover uh, de detailed decisions that, uh, that need to be made prior to the launch of a program. And we, we facilitate that in a way that, that uncovers those naturally. Um, we, we get to decisions very quickly with clients. And some of those decisions are probably obvious details. So you know, making decisions as to the, uh, the, 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 the populations that we want to monitor um, what disease conditions, uh, you know, what, what are the kit compositions, you know, what devices do we want to include in a connected health kit? Those are some of the more obvious decisions, but, but, uh, but also more detailed uh, decisions, you know, they, they get to the decisions on whether we want to include the personal emergency response or the, the video visits, or, you know, even something as, uh, you know, as simple as uh, the, the, the branded logo on the screen, you know, whether it's the provider's uh, logo or someone else. So we, we, we work with our clients, um, and then we ultimately develop a, a program plan that captures these decisions uh, so that all parties uh, agree on, on the plan that we're going to put together. And then we have an, Im an implementation process where we uh, put that to implementation. And, and our, our goal is to get that right the first time. So there's very little iteration because we've gone through this planning process. And uh, as I described earlier, uh, most of these are our are, are, um, implementation time, configuration time decisions so we can implement, excuse me, those very quickly. And, uh, and ultimately the goal is to, to get to the, the point that we can train the client on how to use the tools. And it's very client specific, it's program specific. So the training is, is uh, tailored for their needs and what the objectives are and the decisions that are made in that process so that we can ultimately get to that first patient enrollment as quickly as possible. And I know today's webinar is really focused on the rapid deployment of an RPM program, but I would remiss, I would be remiss not to at least mention what happens post-launch, because I think that's a very important part of the process and a very important part of uh, a client's success long-term. And, and as, as, a, as a partner in that process, we, uh, we, we support our clients post-launch, we, we work with them, we provide monthly summaries and we look for opportunities to, uh, to continue to improve the program. And, and quite often, as is the case with uh, uh, the client study I mentioned, Many clients have a roadmap of their own. They have a vision on what they want to achieve. And, and uh, you know, usually that implementation is carved up into phases so they know what they want to do initially. And we work with them to, to continue and iterate on that. And I, I think that's something that I'm, um, you know, personally very passionate about is, is uh, uh, helping organizations achieve that vision and, and using the platform to, to accomplish that. So John, um, that brings to mind the future success of programs overall and kind of what your vision is uh, taking Clear Arch Health forward. Uh, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, you know, it's just sort of the fun part of thinking about where we're going from here. And um, to, to quote a few statistics or from a survey, um, there was a Wall Street Journal poll of about 1,500 physicians. And the, the outcome was 73% of those responded, they'd like to continue to use telemedicine to conduct chronic disease management appointments. 50% uh, for medication management, 50% for care coordination, and interestingly, 53% for preventative care. Additionally, 75% of patients said that they were very likely or extremely likely to choose video consultation uh, when in person. So I, I bring that up to, to basically, you know, when you think about where this is going and questions about reimbursement and implementation, I'm sort of using the analogy now of it's like employers with talking about getting their employees back to offices and it has forever changed. Uh, third, I think the number I saw like 39% of employees said they would consider changing their employer if they were required to go back to work every day. 
And I think that's where we are with what happened in this last year in terms of where we're going uh, in the future. And, and what I, the way I see it is telehealth, telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, which initially were all individual components are converging. Uh, digital health companies like ours will need to continue to evolve as well uh, to meet those needs of a much broader patient population um, and going well beyond simply capturing biometric data and alerting for specific patients. So we'll combine and integrate this biometric data with data around things like physical activity and nutrition and behavior health assessments and social determinants of health and apply this intelligence and analytics to deliver a much more clear vision of that individual's health and wellness needs. So our focus will continue to be on providing real impact on patient outcomes, overall cost of care and efficiencies and profitability for providers, whether they operate in a fee-for-service world or moving to this fee-for-value world. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kabedar, you know, where, where do you see things heading? You, you know, the, the pandemic caused um, an opportunity for all of us to learn so much more. And I'd like to know your take on even the impact on policy change that we might see because of it. Um, tell us more about that. Sure, and <clears throat> I, I completely uh, endorse everything that, that John said uh, about more devices, more Internet of Things, more uh, analytics on the back end, more artificial intelligence to point out uh, and predict those patients that need services before they need them. Uh, and on the patient side, helping those people um, manage their own health better with that same information. So there's this enormously exciting time ahead of us. I think the policy front looks uh, um, optimistic, although it's cloudy right now. Uh, the, um, uh, there, there's one law that needs to be changed. It's, it's called uh, 1834M or the originating site law uh, for Medicare. And although that's not directly relevant to our business here, it's relevant to the overall enthusiasm for telehealth. Um, and that law says that if you're a Medicare recipient and you're going to enter a, a video conversation, you have to be in a health profession shortage area. We all know that there are the RPM codes and those were specifically put in place without the word telehealth for a reason because Medicare didn't want them held up by this law. Nonetheless, in the last year, they've sort of been smushed together in people's minds. So that's a very important policy thing that we're looking carefully at. And then state by state, payer by payer, making sure that they see the light and the value of increasing uh, uh, their telehealth footprint. The good news is about what the, uh, ClearArch does, and, and I said it at the beginning, I wanna emphasize it again, is it's about efficiency. And it's about uh, helping organizations take care of more patients with fewer human resources. And it's also about giving organizations the opportunity to keep them out of the high cost part of the system. And as we get more and more uh, value-based payments and more and more encouragement of those uh, values, we'll see a more and more adoption of this particular brand of telehealth. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you and, and John's points about how to bring in data, how to communicate with patients in, in ways that they're comfortable to communicate uh, through these types of devices and platforms is really important. And, and the point that you made even about, you know, a, a, reduced access to care in certain areas. I think we're kind of trending in that direction everywhere. You know, there, there's fewer doctors and, and even in urban areas, it becomes more of a challenge. Uh, so this, this kind of technology becomes more and more necessary and policy will help make that happen because patients are patients, whether they're rural or urban or, you know, they, wherever they are, they just need care. And we yeah. need to reach that equality of care. So uh, I think, that we're receiving some questions. And so I wanna go ahead and, and throw some questions out to the team here and the panelists. So if you'll just give me a couple moments, I'm gonna transition over. So first question is for Chris. Uh, Chris, will how will you continue to include telehealth and RPM into care if reimbursement for it at the current level is decreased after the public health emergency is declared over? 
Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I think that's kind of a, a maybe a, a common misconception that, that, you know, some of this reimbursement was, um, you know, put in place for the pandemic and I, for the public health emergency. And I, you know, I'll, maybe Dr. Kovadar can, uh, you know, add to this, but specifically with remote patient monitoring, which I'll, I'll speak to because I'm most familiar with remote patient monitoring, but the, the CMS codes for reimbursement predated the pandemic. And there were some concessions that CMS made during the pandemic, especially for COVID-19 patients. I'm aware specifically that the, uh, the 16 uh, transmissions was reduced to two transmissions per month uh, for patients that either had COVID-19 or suspected to have COVID-19. Um, and, and CMS has been specific that that would be uh, reversed um, post um, the, the um, public health emergency, but, uh, but they've also implied that, uh, the, that the others would persist. Yes, I think that's right. And, and uh, it just underscores uh, <laughs> when you say telehealth what you mean. So the, the, the last year, the big bullhorn has been virtual video visits. And we're talking today about remote patient monitoring. They do link, as we've, as we've said, but the remote patient monitoring world has been pretty stable this whole time and grown a bit. Uh, and it's grown a bit because people now realize that they can provide care at a distance and it's a good idea and it worked and there's it's a jumping off point for more visioning and more adoption. But you're quite right, the codes are the same. The other thing I'll just mention, if people are looking at that 16 versus two days, uh, we have it on good authority that, that the PHE will last through the end of this calendar year. And the word on, at least in DC nowadays, is that they're probably going to extend the healthcare part of this for a year or two so they can study further what exactly it means and come up with long-term policies that they think makes sense. So we'll see, but, but that gives us a good long runway to get to do our advocacy work and to prove our case, I think. You had mentioned earlier in our discussion about kind of what our perceptions were for the utilization of telemedicine or telehealth, and maybe it was underutilized prior to the pandemic. Um, in some cases, it was, it was reserved for acute care, episodic care, and not necessarily for chronic care management. And that became you know, critical uh, as soon as the pandemic hit. Uh, there were articles out that there were a lot of gaps that physicians felt like they were missing part of the patient picture. Can you kind of speak to that in terms of that patient level data and, and how remote patient monitoring kind of came to fit in to fill that gap? Yeah, I think the easiest way to, to frame that question is to just think about, and I say this to my uh, physician colleagues uh, many, many times, which is what, what information do you need to make a decision, either a care plan or a diagnostic decision? And unless you're doing mental health purely, it's often more than just talking to the patient. So the video is a connection, and it's an important one. We're, we're demonstrating that today. But and if I need more information about my patient to make a clinical decision, then again, unless I'm doing behavioral health, then I need something. So internists would do things like, and, and I think the uh, a necessity as a mother of invention comment comes to mind here, but a friend of mine who's an internist said, well, I can't listen to their lungs, so I have them climb a flight of stairs and I'll see if they're short of breath that way. People were doing all kinds of things during the lockdown to try to recapitulate that physical exam function. The beauty of remote patient monitoring, and, and, and it could be, you know, could be weight, it could be blood pressure, it could be uh, uh, diabetes, uh, blood sugar levels, uh, as we've talked about, step counts. There's all kinds of things that we can now collect that will inform a clinician to be able to make a better decision without having the patient come in front of them and having to touch them. And that's where the two fit together. Great, thank you. So I have another question from the audience. Um, and this one, I'm, I'm gonna ask each one of you to provide a response because you, each of you bring a different perspective. The telehealth market has a large number of players. How do we select the best strategic partners for our clients? Well, I'm happy to go first. I think from a provider perspective, it's flexibility, um, integrity, of course, uh, those are the basics. Uh, someone who'll sit down with us and really talk through, uh, it, it's more of a partnership, to be honest with you. We don't have too many in this space anyway, that where I think 
in some of the more commoditized aspects of our business. Uh, we have true vendor relationships, but uh, and maybe the lowest bid wins. But typically in this, it's much more of a partnership concept and flexibility, as I said, integrity, willingness to think uh, uh, creatively about how we implement and how we realize value on both sides, I think is important. The, the basics, of course, uh, uh, of solid technology, solid privacy security, all those things matter a lot. And, in, and when possible, how are we gonna integrate into our electronic record? But those are sort of table stakes. And then you get into this, I think really partnership conversation. That's great, thank you. I see Chris nodding on my yeah. side. So Chris, I think that you have some, some input to this question too. Yeah, well, I, I I love that Dr. Cavadar used the word partnership because I think that's uh, that that's certainly how you know I look at this. And I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, I, I you know as as on the vendor side of that table, I, I am very passionate about helping organizations achieve their vision. And um, you know, I agree I agree with everything that Dr. Cavadar said. You know, being able to think creatively and and uh, you know, help organizations get there. I think my my only thing that I would add is that uh, um, consider, you know, I would encourage organizations to consider what happens when things don't go well. Um, so, you know, I think uh, selecting a partner that that is going to be there with you through the through the thick of it and 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 uh, you know help solve problems is is important as well. Yeah, thank you. And John, you know, you've worked with organizations in a variety of capacities in this healthcare space. And as a leader in healthcare, I'm sure you have a lot to weigh in on as, as far as picking the right strategic partner. Yeah, thanks, Doreen. Um, so I think it's, it's a couple of things. One is, can they meet your current needs, right? So if you're in a fee-for-service world, can you make sure that you've got a program put in place where you're going to maximize the reimbursements and ensuring you have somebody who's credible and knowledgeable and has done this and knows how to do it? But as importantly is, as we start to look out further, uh, is it someone that can grow with you as you grow your program and as you expand your program and as you look at more of a fee for value world in particular, can that company stay with you through that process? Can they integrate with you? Dr. Kvedar talked about you know, integrating with EHR, but I mentioned earlier about you know, the proliferation of, of wearables is now starting to take place. And at how can we capture information that's generated in other ways and be able to incorporate that and be able to utilize that? So I think each one has to look at your program, what you're trying to accomplish, what ultimately you're trying to accomplish. And then it'll, it'll start to separate in terms of those companies that are, are, are see that vision and can work with you and grow, or those that are you know a quick implementation of a program today, and that's all you're looking for, because that will clearly divide the players out there. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. It, it's, you know, you have to have the ability to listen to your client. And to Chris's point, uh, sometimes things need to change and they need to change quickly. And you have to have an organization that is available and that they're able to react quickly. And you know, all of it in the end is to impact better care for patient populations. So we're, we're you know, providing technology that improves the quality of care. We also have to improve customer care in order to make that happen. So I think that, that that's a great question. So John, um, often remote patient monitoring or in-home monitoring is reserved for those populations with chronic conditions or those who are at risk of an event uh, such as a hospitalization or rehospitalization. If you had a crystal ball, um, what would it tell you about the future of innovation in healthcare beyond the most popular use cases? Where should RPM be considered to be used? That's, that's a great question. And um, you know, there are some already evolving, right? Um, in terms of behavioral health and behavioral health assessments. You know, we know a lot from this pandemic and people particularly being alone that there's there's in particularly with, a, with an elderly population and the, the concern about depression. And so it's a great tool and a great opportunity there. Um, we're starting to incorporate social determinants of health. So we're getting a much better vision of the environment around and in which a person lives. Um, but specific to other use cases, um, there's, a, there's a, a company in um, Israel right now that's got remote monitoring technology for high-risk pregnancies. 
it's a great application, right? You think about during that, the last thing we need to do is having that individual going back and forth to, to their physician's office if they can be assessed um, in the comfort and, and, and privacy of their home. And then also uh, in the whole fall prevention area, you know, wearables are getting smarter. And I said fall prevention, not fall detection, where we're starting to look at how do we become more determinate and see and understand more in depth and be able to start preventing things from occurring. So I, I think those are some specific areas where we're already starting to get tested and, and we'll, we'll see those being implemented uh, as these technologies continue to integrate together. Oh, that's great. Um, Dr. Kabadar, um, telehealth and connected care is evolving quickly. Frequently when discussing telehealth, the focus is on the provider patient relationship. What role do you see the payers playing in the future of telehealth? Oh, they have to pay for it. Uh, I don't mean to be uh, <clears throat> glib, but um, that is a challenge for them. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, their strategy was to run it through the large national payer uh, providers like uh, Teladoc Health and Amwell and others uh, and provide it to you, the end user, through their uh, health plan portal, not that there's anything particularly wrong with that, but it is does fragment care. And that's last year, I think one of the uh, largest national payers quoted to me that uh, uh, in 2020, for the majority of the year, 96% of their telehealth claims came from what they call local physicians, local providers, people like me reaching out to my patients, as opposed to the teledocs and, and the AMWELs. And it's swinging back in that direction as we start to see providers retreating a little bit from their high of about a year ago. And so the payer has this dilemma that what do I pay for and how do I, I mean, their whole uh, uh, business is about uh, getting the right amount of access, not too much, not too much utilization. And that's their struggle. Uh, I think sometimes they take, this is my, I'm a provider. So my view is a little different. I think they use blunt instruments sometimes, like saying we won't pay for telephone and we won't pay for X, um, because that, again, they're feeling like they're doing their uh, their business model a favor. But in fact, what we have to do in response as providers, and I'll I'll just finish with this, is we have to demonstrate to them that we're not doing something that's additive, but substitutive. And your again, remote patient monitoring is a perfect example of that. I can have you know, one nurse monitoring 100 patients, if, if uh, that person set up properly with a proper set of algorithms from an RPM program. Whereas if I put that same nurse in a car and have that individual drive around and see patients, they might see five during a day. So we know that remote patient monitoring can and should be the friend of the payers. We just have to be, I think, a little more uh, vocal about demonstrating that to them. Yeah. Let, let me let me add, Doreen, if I don't mind, yeah. add quickly to that, because I think this is a great opportunity uh, where we use the word partnering before. You know, that's that's up to us as the as the, the the companies that are working with our our clients is to work with them and to be able to show that evidence, right? To put together and whether it's you know clinical studies or white papers, but to work together to show that we are truly adding adding and improving outcomes while reducing the cost, because ultimately that's, you know, we all know that's what the payers are, are there for, right? They need to, to ensure that in the end, that the, over the lifetime of this individual or this particular um, period of time that, that we've, we've delivered value, uh, better value for that individual, but we've done it at or below uh, the cost that they're currently incurring. And so it's, it's, a, it's a joint responsibility for us to do this together. Just one, one very quick uh, additional comment. It, the way, another way I like to think about this is a video visit is um, just taking what we do in the office and moving it by distance. It doesn't add any particular efficiency. And um, again, that's been the big bullhorn for the last year. And we have a lot, those of us that are in the industry, have a, a, that's a lot to be thankful for in terms of raising awareness but it isn't efficient. And if I were a repair, I'd be worried about that too, because what you don't want is for me to say to my patient, yes, I think probably you should come in the office and then not billing them twice for the same evaluation and management service because I couldn't do it on video. So we, we really owe them to, to figure that out. Now, 
again, just to underscore, the RPM world doesn't really have that problem because it's really more about efficiency and spreading care of many patients over fewer providers. That should be the, the, the friend of the payers and they should embrace that. Thank you. Yeah, I very much agree with you on that. Um, and I do have a question from the audience from William Bernstein. Um, he asked about, does CMS have any guidance as to which patients are appropriate to enroll with a blood pressure monitor, for example? There's a lot of questions around this, like when is the right time to add RPM, a patient to an RPM program? In this case, he asked, you know, uh, is it for all patients with hypertension or those who are not controlled? So Dr. Bader, I'll let you answer that one first. Sure, great, great question. Um, so uh, in terms of the, just quickly on the mechanics, there is coding now for, man, uh, for the period of time when you as a clinician discover someone in your office has high blood pressure in the office. And in order to sort out whether that's white coat versus real hypertension, the, the standard of care now is to have those patients take blood pressure cuffs home and, and measure blood pressure in the home for a week or, or 10 days. That can be done via an RPM interface if you have it at your disposal. And there's separate codes to bill for that apart from the ones we talked about earlier. So that's just a point to be made. <clears throat> a bigger picture answer, I have high blood pressure. It's well controlled. I'd be annoyed if I was on a remote patient monitoring program because I don't need to monitor anything. I have it taken once or twice a year and that's fine. When someone's either starting out, as I just mentioned, or having challenges controlling their blood pressure, RPM for high blood pressure is a perfect solution because it gets into their life and gives the clinician windows of insight into why certain times in their life might be real, resulting in higher numbers, et cetera, can help with just not, met, not only medicine management, but lifestyle management as well. So it's a great indication for, for that. Great, there's a follow-up question to that. It's, it, it's specific to the length of time you put a patient on RPM. And you just mentioned that, you know, there's a level of acuity that might be more appropriate for some patients to engage in RPM than others. Uh, so how long should a patient be allowed to be enrolled until after the BP is adequately controlled or indefinitely? And, and what's the intent of the CMS reimbursement codes in that case? Uh, you know, it's, it's, I'll leave it to you, Dr. Kavader. I know there's a lot of tools and engagement ways to connect with patients using these platforms. Speak to that for a moment. Well, I think it's up to the, the individual that's, <clears throat> excuse me, using the tool to decide what they want the tool to achieve. When we did, uh, for instance, heart failure remote patient monitoring in our delivery system, we designed it to be a two month program because we felt like during that time, we could educate the patients on what fluid management meant, what weight meant. Um, and candidly, after that, if they were engaged, they could weigh themselves on their own scale and pick up the phone and call a clinician when their weight went up. Uh, interestingly enough, that didn't apply to all of our patients. What a surprise, right? There are people that, that were on it forever, literally, because they just needed that relationship with a home care nurse or the call center nurse um, and the vital sign monitoring allowed them a, a conversation starter about their illness and how to manage it. So it, it really varies um, according to the patient. It varies according to the use case. Heart failure is a different use case than high blood pressure than even type two diabetes. So that, that's maybe not a very satisfying answer, but it's, a, it's an accurate one. It really varies. Thank you for providing that. Um, we have a couple more questions, and then I think I'm going to ask the, the panelists to please just provide maybe some more um, insight or advice to anyone in the group. So one more question. Uh, Dr. Kvader, will be there be any new changes to the HIPAA rules as a result of the pandemic? If so, how would these changes impact telehealth or telemedicine? I haven't heard of any, and uh, all the all the um, all the energy has been around uh, some of those other uh, policy matters that I spoke about er earlier. The originating site rule, uh, allowing federally qualified health centers to participate in telehealth, 
Uh, there's an in-person requirement, which is driving us all nuts that, uh, that in order to bill for telehealth, you have to have had at least one visit in person. We think that's kind of stupid too. So we're working on a lot of that. HIPAA is pretty rock solid. Um, the technologies, it's interesting, but in the beginning of the pandemic, everyone could use any technology they wanted. You still can, but so many of those companies that provide video technology quickly built a HIPAA compliant solution that we still recommend that you go in that direction. Uh, this morning's Wall Street Journal had a, an article on how many healthcare systems are getting held up for cyber uh, ransom. So it's really important for us to pay close attention to the, how the technology fits together and that we don't have any holes in the network. So I think HIPAA is really important for not just the patient privacy, but the whole security of the network perspective. Well, that brings us to our last question, and this one's for Chris. So um, with regard to the current health information technology infrastructure, um, should there be any modifications uh, to those structures in light of uh, the post-pandemic world? And as uh, organizations shift from fee-for-service fee to uh, outcomes-based payments, uh, do you have any insight on that, Chris? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, the, the second part of the question with the outcome base um, is, is uh, you know, I, I, I think there's, you know, I, I, I guess my, my suggestion first is, you know, the, the HIPAA and security provisions aside, you know, certainly that's, that's fundamental. So I'm assuming the question is not really, um, you know, in regards to that, but I, I do think that, uh, um, you know, having clear goals in mind and having a, a way to measure those. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Kavadar mentioned, the, the adoption and, and, you know, worldwide on, on remote technologies is, is high. Um, I, I think one thing we've seen firsthand with our clients is, is just the, the difficulty in, in using different siloed platforms uh, for these various functions. So, so now that we, you know, now that organizations are embracing virtual care, I, I think maybe that's still an opportunity for these systems to work uh, better together and, you know, everything needs to be integrated with the EHR. And, um, and so I think that's, that's maybe an opportunity to be able to support these, but, but certainly uh, I think fundamentally uh, just, just having a platform in place to track and measure the goals is, is helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Follow the data. Thank you. Um, and I'll ask the panelists just if you'll give some advice or insight that you can give some of our audience as they're facing the rapid deployment of an RPM program post pandemic. Uh, so John, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, um, you know, we've, we've tried not to have a, a commercial here, um, but, I, but I think, you know, one of the most important parts is that you reach out to your uh, potential partner and you have a candid conversation. Chris just said it as far as, you know, clearly setting goals and what you're trying to accomplish. And I would encourage any of you that are either with a program that's not really working to your, um, your, your satisfaction today, or you're thinking about, um, you know, structuring a program, reach out to us. Any of us will be happy to talk to you. We have a really, really dynamic and a really strong team that will be happy to sit down and assess. And if it makes sense, continue forward. But if not, at least help you through the process of identifying if and when and how uh, to, to deploy a program if you have not yet, yet done so or you want to improve the program that you currently have underway. Thanks, John. How about you, Chris? Yeah, so my, my advice would be to be realistic about um, you know, what, what competencies you'd like to take on as a, as a healthcare provider. And, and by that, I mean, um, we've seen that there's a tendency for many providers to, um, you know, to, to, to try to, you know, maximize the, uh, I guess, the financial, um, you know, fee-for-service model and purchase equipment. Um, and, and then ultimately what happens is they get in the tech support business. So there's a provider, they're you know, managing the equipment and, having to manage the life cycle of that equipment, um, you know, the sanitization, uh, uh, the, the Bluetooth pairing, the, the upgrades. And um, that's, that's, I think that I, I guess I would just caution that that is a difficult endeavor to, uh, to take on and uh, uh, to potentially select a partner that can bring some of those core competencies to the table so that as a provider, you can focus on providing best, best in care or best in class care and, and uh, leverage a, a partnership to do that. Thank you, Chris. Dr. Kvedar, um, you bring a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure you have some good tidbits of advice. 
Probably the biggest big picture error that I see is people think of this as a technology discussion and it's a care delivery discussion. It's about how you want to use this tool to deliver better care to the right populations, right place, right time, uh, more efficient care. We've talked about that, extend access. And I really urge people to think about it in that way. People would come to me and still do, not as much as they used to, but they say, what platform should I buy or what technology should I use? And I really try to steer them more to a higher level strategic discussion about care delivery. And then we back into uh, what makes sense for them. It's, it's a big mistake to try to choose a technology without thinking those other things through. Excellent, thank you. And I, I wanna thank everybody who's attended the webinar today. Uh, if your questions weren't answered during this webinar, we will be sending out responses after the webinar. Everybody's going to receive a copy of our new white paper. Uh, so again, thank you for attending. Uh, all the team at Clear Arch Health uh, really does value your time and we appreciate your attendance. Thank you.